Thank you. Wow, great energy in the room. So I have to tell you a story. This is my second TED Talk, and the first time was an experiment. It was an experiment for everyone. It was an experiment for TED. It was an experiment for USC. It was the first independently organized TED event, so TEDx USC. And people said, if this goes on the TED website, your life will change. Okay, we're in Vegas, right? You hear that a lot. Do this and your life will change. Read this book, your life will change. Go to this course, your life will change. So several months later, I was up in the woods of Wisconsin, got no cell phone coverage, unless I went to this one spot in my hotel room and kind of stood there with one foot and kind of did this. And I remember that because every time I did that, my phone would ring. And my phone would ring, and my phone would ring, and my phone would ring. And one of the calls was the email administrator at USC who said, would you please do something about your inbox? It's tanked the entire system. And that's what happened when the TED Talk went live. So when it came time to do another TED Talk, I went to the community that formed as a result of my life changing. See, that's really what happened, was this community formed. This community of communities and people and dozens of people and hundreds of people and thousands of people and even tens of thousands of people began showing up. And they wanted to apply this stuff. They wanted to build great tribes. And the line that I concluded the TED Talk at USC, in front of about 1,800 people with, was a throwaway line. It just kind of seemed like a way to wrap it, which was, you can build a tribe that can change the world. And since then, one of the things that's happened is a lot of people have done that. But I wish I could stand here and say that every person had formed a great tribe and had changed the world. But you see, some people didn't have the luck that others had. The thing about the world is it doesn't always want to be changed, right? The world sometimes fights back. See, if you remember the movie Braveheart, right? We remember the guy on the, on the horse and half his face was blue. What we maybe don't remember, unless somebody specifically points it out, was the guy got tortured on a rack, right? I mean, sometimes when you try to change the world, really bad things happen to you. And so I went to the community, I'm getting ready for this, and just posed the question, what is it, what's the next line in the play? And so everything that I'm gonna lead you through here and talk about, first of all, comes from the gut, because that's what the group said to do. The most important piece of advice they said is, untuck your shirt, man, it's not USC, it's Las Vegas, okay, so. And they said, wear jeans, okay, but it was at USC before, a college president was there, different environment, okay. And they said, come from the gut. And so, probably the most important quote that I think of when I think of changing the world is this famous quote from um, Margaret Mead, and it's become kind of a cliche, and it's up on the screen here, and the essence of it is that a small group of people can change the world. But here's the very cynical way to look at it, and I call this Logan's corollary to this very famous quote which is that never doubt that a small group of thoughtless, uncommitted people can prevent the world from changing. Indeed, they do so every day. <laughs> so here's why we're having this conversation. You are here because you wanna change the world. It's probably not a surprise. You can't do it alone unless you have superpowers. And if you are, because we're here in Vegas, I really wanna go play roulette with you, right? So that we can win a lot of money. So you're gonna have to build a tribe. And so what people said is, first of all, do a very quick, deja vu on the five tribal stages, right? People said to do that. And then they said there's three things that people absolutely need if they're going to build a tribe that doesn't immediately get crushed. I had the opportunity this week to ride for a number of hours in the back of a limousine with one of my mentors, Warren Bennis at USC. He's, I believe, now 86 years old. And we were talking about one change effort that had really jumped the tracks. It had not gone the way that we had hoped it was going to go. A lot of people got their feelings hurt, and frankly, I'm really disappointed by a lot of people involved. And Warren sat back and he said, the thing is about change is that change has no constituents. Change has no constituents. So I want you to think about that as we go through this. The question is, your tribes, are they like Margaret Mead's tribe, the one that can change the world, or are they sort of my cynical version? So here very quickly is the tribal leadership deja vu. Some of you are familiar with this. We'll all be up on the same page by the time we're done. So first of all, there's what we call stage one. Okay, remember this is groups of people. This is not individuals, but this is how life occurs to them. That it is unfair that you cannot cut a break. It's as though you're a person in this prison behind me. Now remember, we're talking about a whole group that views the world this way. This is where you get despairing hostility, acts of violence, really bad things. Stage two, remember there are five. Here's the second one. 
is kind of the Department of Motor Vehicles, right? So we've got our friends here from The Simpsons. This is the place of not really despairing hostility, just kind of a bummer. So the future that people in stage two see isn't terrible, it's not hopeless, it's just not particularly fun, right? It's a bummer, it's like it going every day to the Department of Motor Vehicles. The third one is my personal favorite because it's the most fun to talk about, Donald Trump is of course the poster child. The most common words you hear are, are I, me, and my. Okay, notice this is, again, the Donald. Now I've heard from people who work with him, he's actually not this way. I'm going off his television personality. So notice how the Donald makes decisions. I know it's scary to see a little face of Donald decapitated. <laughs> Some of you, that may please. If you do, let's talk later. You need to advance your evolution of consciousness, okay. So around Donald are people and Donald forms relationships like this, and his goal is to make them all little mini Donalds, right? This is good, because now everybody's like me, and they make decisions like me. So this is stage three, this is I, me, mean, my, this is, the, this is the problem in healthcare and academia, okay? If your tribes are like this, here's the future. And if you ask anyone, they'll say the same thing. If only everybody would just shut up and do what I say, this could be really cool. The problem is they won't shut up. So I'll say it again, and I'll say it with more gestures, and I'll inflect my voice more, and I might even go and try to, you know, order them around, make something bad happen if they don't do it. Stage three, runs businesses, and it's why businesses are not particularly effective. Now, stage four, this is where something really remarkable happens, okay? I'm from USC, so my faculty contract says, I got it, at some point show the Trojan colors, so here they are. But this is where you get a whole group of people that comes together with shared values and they say, we're great, okay? This is where high performance begins to show up. And then the very last one, and these are the tribes that can change the world, are ones where there's no them. Because here, of course, USC is playing somebody else, somebody has to win, somebody has to lose, that's the nature of the game. But at stage five, this is a scene that may surprise some of you. This is the Manhattan Project group that built the first atomic bomb. Say, well, that's not particularly fun, right? Building bombs could end the world. But you see, it was a group of people that came together, first of all, to try to end the war. Many people had fled Nazi Germany. They knew what would happen if the Nazi regime got the bomb first. And they also wanted to bring atomic power to the world. And this small group of people came together, driven only by their passion, their values, and yes, their genius, and they changed the world. And so, with that deja vu, here then are the three things, and please understand, this is from the gut, okay? From the gut. You have to do, or the world will try to crush you when you come and try to change it. The first one is you absolutely have to build what are called triads. I mentioned Warren Bennis earlier. He's in the background here. I'm, of course, one of the people. Tony Shea is one of the other people. Now, I'm showing this slide to you for a very important reason. So this was when uh, Tony was talking about his book, came to USC, something very interesting happened when they came out. I introduced them, in fact, if you listen to Delivering Happiness, the audio book, the last hour or so is this recorded conversation. I introduced them, they were on stage, Warren was on one chair, Tony was in the other, and, and they chatted. And during the conversation, here's what happened, and I want, to put, I want you to put yourself in the place of the three characters in the story. Warren made an offhand comment about, Tony, there's something you can do for me, I would really love to have some shoes. And he, re and he pulled a slip, slip of paper out and he mentioned the name and the size and so on. And everyone laughed, including me. We thought it was a joke, including Tony. And a few days later, I talked to Warren and it turned out Warren didn't actually think that was a joke. He didn't know where his shoes were. See, the fabric of the relationship had been ripped. Now, ripped by what? A silly misunderstanding that happened on stage in front of a bunch of people. We all thought it was a joke. So what do you do? See, a three-person relationship is what a triad is. It is three people who share values and they've got each other's back. More importantly, they've got the relationships back. So, remembering triads, I called someone who's here, Robert Richman. I said, Robert, we got a problem. Warren made this comment. He was actually serious. We all thought he was a j joke. Robert connects. A couple days later, my phone rings. It's Warren. He is now the world's biggest Sappos fan. I can't believe it. This whole box or this whole pallet of boxes showed up and it was all these shoes and I'm amazed and I'm gonna order them for my grandchildren. My whole life is different. Okay, so I want you to notice what happened because this, again, I appreciate, appreciate the laughter, appreciate the recognition. I mean, the recognition that this is a useful principle, but see, when the world shows up, because remember, the world doesn't wanna be changed and change has no constituents. Excuse me, they're gonna put enormous pressure on you. You've got to have a group that can withstand the pressure. 
What is behind me is three people, they're all smiling. You, your job is to, of course, build relationships between them, but each and every person has the job of making sure that all of the relationships in that group are rock solid. So when I learned that something had happened between Warren and Tony, it was my job to patch it up. Now I learned this from someone, from John King, one of the people that I wrote Tribal Leadership with. So first thing I hope you'll do right now, just sit here and think, who are the people in my world where I don't just have their back, but I have the relationship back, and they have the relationship that I have with other people? Now some people look at this and say, but what about marriage, right? I'm from California, even in California, marriage is two people. Even in Vegas, it's two people. Am I saying that marriage should be three people? No, no, no. But a good marriage will be supported by many other people who have the back of that relationship. That's what makes it into something stable that can really stand the test of time. So, here's where we are. Hope you build stage five tribes. In order to do it, you've got to build the, the crystalline structure of these triads because this can hold up to any pressure. Now comes to what I think is the coolest thing of all, okay? The fact that triads can grow exponentially. So we've got about 100 people here, okay? So three people can form essentially one triad, right? Three, one, that's probably obvious. The question is how many people or how many triads can you form with four people? The answer, of course, is you can see where it's going. And then 10 people can form 120. So we've got about 100 here. Any guesses as to how many triads could form in a group of 100 people? Heard 1,000? Good guess. A million? Not quite. 161,700. Here's the thing. If you form six stable triads, something amazing will happen. I don't know what it is, but I promise it will be amazing. Love this photo. This is an early uh, company photograph from Microsoft, right? Bill Gates said that two things are responsible for Microsoft's success. One is the original 100 people, and the second is the relationship between those 100 people. See, the triadic relationships is what allowed it to happen. They were under enormous pressure. One company after another tried to crush them. Okay, now we get to the essence of something, right? You build your triads, the goal is six. When you form six, something magical happens. You're forming Margaret Mead-style tribes that can change the world. There is something that you need to go through, and this, I believe, is the coolest thing in this entire thing, all right? It's called the Batman effect. Remember when Michael Keaton did the original kind of reboot of Batman, it had been Bruce Wayne, uh, sorry, not Bruce Wayne, but uh, Adam West, right? It's been Adam West, kind of car cartoony, a little sort of weird. And then they did the reboot. It was a little dark, okay? So Fox aired a, an animated series that was based on essentially the reboot. And I think it was the truest form of Batman that ever came along. In one particular episode, I just want to take you through this, okay? Bruce Wayne is captured because someone wants to get Batman. So they beat Bruce Wayne on the back of the head and he has amnesia, and he's in a box, and he's waiting for Batman, because he doesn't remember that he's Batman. And he's angry, and he's pounding on the box, where's Batman, when is Batman gonna show up to save me? Until something happens. He remembers that he's Batman. Now nothing has changed. Same guy, in the same box, and what happens? He rips off the ropes, he kicks the back of the door off the box, and he kicks butt. Now why am I telling you the story? The Greeks believed, they believed this literally, I'm gonna present it as a metaphor, that when you were born, before you were born, you looked out at the world, and you picked your parents, and you picked your life, and you picked the problems that are in the world, because there's something that you wanted to learn. And after making that momentous decision, there was one thing that you had to do before you were born, and that was you had to forget. You had to forget choosing. See, I want to present this, and I'm not saying that, I'm not, um, don't take me literally, but I would like to present this as perhaps the most important metaphor ever. Notice what happened in Egypt in 18 days. People realized they were Batman. They remembered they were Batman. And something that had been impossible for 30 years changed, transformed in a period of 18 days. That's the Batman effect. So as you're sitting here in the chair, just consider, or watching on the web, just consider that maybe, just maybe, at some point you made a choice that you were gonna change the world, you as a person, in some fundamental, fantastic, unbelievable way. And the only thing that's preventing you from kicking down the back of that box and getting rid of the ropes 
and kicking behind is the fact that you don't remember that you're Batman. And when you have that thought, here's what you want to remember. Maybe, just maybe, you are Batman. See, Batman, who forms tribes, who forms triads, can change the world. There's one more thing you have to do, and that is you have to rewrite the future. It may seem strange, but the future is already written. What's up here is a very nice scene, right? I want you to imagine that you're on vacation, you're in a chair, and this is what you see. This is what's literally hitting your eyeballs. Two silly questions. Number one, what do you expect to happen? It's gonna get darker, what else? You've got a little drink in your hand, it's probably got an umbrella, what else? What do you expect to happen? Your masseuse is gonna show up, right? So it's kind of relaxing things. In other words, it's gonna be more the same until eventually the sun sets. Now, I said two silly questions, here's the second one. So what are you gonna do? What, literally, what action will you take? You expect more of the same. So what are you gonna do? Hang out, order another drink, have a massage, right? So whatever it is you expect to happen, and this lives in your gut, remember this whole thing is from the gut, determines your performance, determines what you'll do. See, Batman, when he remembered he was Batman, suddenly the future changed. The future was different than it was before. All of you have a default future right now. You have a default future for your career, for your relationship. You have a default future for what your life is gonna be like. And a lot of the TED Talks we've heard here today have been about examining that and perhaps rewriting it. Now, a friend of mine is a psychiatrist. And so she goes into couples counseling and she presents this idea that there is a future that lives in your gut and you already know it even though you probably haven't articulated it. And so she goes into a situation with couples counseling and she says, what's the default future of this relationship? People say, what does that mean? And she says, well, it lives in your gut and it's what you expect to happen, assuming that nothing really bizarre comes along, you know, unless a meteorite hits the planet. I mean, what's in your gut? Go to your gut and just give words to it. And often they'll say, like the couple here, oh, we're gonna get divorced. And they look at each other surprised, maybe even shocked that they've said it. Well, really, that's, that's what's in your gut? Well, I, I mean, I guess, I'm kind of surprised when I'm saying it, but sure, I mean, we're gonna hang out in therapy, probably shed a few tears, and then we'll do everything we can, but we'll get divorced, that way we can tell the kids, that way we can tell the friends, well, we did everything we could. It just wasn't meant to be. Here's the next question that she asks. Okay, is that what you want? And in many cases, they say, no, I don't want that. I want something different. See, at that point, they can remember that they're Batman and that they're not bound by whatever they think is gonna happen even though it's living in their gut. Okay, so let's wrap this whole thing up. First of all, only tribes can change the world. The particular kind of tribes that can change the world are the ones that are based purely on values, where it's not us versus them, it's pure values. The problem is the world doesn't necessarily want to be changed. Change has no constituents. And so as you do this, there are three things that my community said you need to learn. Number one, build triads. Make them bulletproof, right? So somebody's got the relationships back. Number two, remember that you're Batman, okay? Bat Bruce Wayne made it up. He was sitting at home and he made it up. You can do that too. And when you do that, the little part of you that's gonna say BS lives in your gut. And that's the part of you that knows the future. So are there actually people walking around the planet that can do this, that did this? In fact, I wanna suggest that every single person that has ever changed the world has done everything that I'm talking about here today. And I wanna conclude with this slide. Because there was a moment when a person walked out on stage and said the default future of the United States is, and he gave words to it. And he said, no, we are not going to do that. Instead, we are gonna make something remarkable happen, something unprecedented, something that, that is gonna come out of nowhere to the point where it will shake the foundations of the world. And people believed him. And that person was Martin Luther King. He was Batman. Ladies and gentlemen, whether you're here or watching, I just want you to remember, you can change the world. Remember, you're Batman. And please remember that when you try to change the world, the world will fight back. But a great tribe is even more powerful than the world. Thank you.